<laughs> it is not off the record. Show me the mask afterwards. No, 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 it's just like check. Yeah. So okay, all good. So Hello, good do. evening, yeah. and welcome. Thanks all for coming. And uh, we're just going to be talking about Saudi Arabia for the next hour and a half or so. I think the title was A Kingdom in Peril, slightly provocatively. Uh, it is also the BBC less, obviously more balanced. We were looking at a programme on this first hundred days of King Salman, rather more neutral way of looking at it. Uh, so obviously lots happened in the last hundred days and there are internal challenges and we will talk about those and there is a big regional situation going on as well and there is the relationship with Iran. So there is lots to talk about. We've got a great panel. We've got Safa Al Ahmed, who is a filmmaker. You may well have seen her stuff. Has it been shown here, probably? Yes. Uh, and so three substantial films, one on internal Saudi and one on Yemen, two, or, two on Yemen now. Uh, so that's Safa. We've got Sir William Patey, who was the ambassador in Saudi Arabia and says he can assure me he will disagree with most people on the panel, so that's a very good start. And we've got uh, Carol Kirsten, who's book, uh, The Caliphate and Islamic Statehood, I recommend to you. It's three volumes and a snip at 450 euros. <laughs> <laughs> so he's not expecting many sales tonight. Robert Lacey, uh, 12 pounds a copy for, uh, for, uh, for his uh, two books, both banned in Saudi Arabia. So, uh, but available here, obviously. They banned the second one as well. Yours must be banned as well. Yes. The second what? one it's is banned Jedi. as well. What? It's in Jedi. Is it? Oh, yes. Well, good news. Good news. Yeah. Only one is banned. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's just start with that, that sort of, um, that, that, that question that the Frontline Club put up, a, qu a kingdom in peril, and I'm just going to ask everyone to give their general view, and we'll have some chat on the panel here, and then I'll open it up very quickly for your questions. So, Safa, why don't you start? A kingdom in peril. Uh, before the war on Yemen, I would have said no, uh, that it's going to be business as usual inside Saudi Arabia. But after the war, I think they've opened up a whole Pandora's box of events uh, that God knows what's going to happen after. So possibly yes, and because of that backlash from the Yemeni war. Can you explain what that backlash would look like? Well, the Houthis, uh, I mean, there is a, a very long border uh, between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And so Saudi Arabia choosing to, to wage war on Yemen uh, could open the possibilities not only for the Houthis to cross over to, Yemen, to Saudi Arabia, which they've done several times already, uh, but possibly it will make it easier for Al-Qaeda as well, who have already attacked the border with Saudi Arabia. So it's, uh, the, the possibilities are now much more open than they were before. Right, so you're saying the border is less of a border than it used to be? Um, they've motivated more people who are against the Saudi government than they used to be, okay. which is a more accurate way of saying it. Okay. Robert Lacey. Um, no, I don't agree with Safa. Um, I don't think Saudi Arabia is waging war on Yemen. Um, I don't think they particularly wanted to go in. I, I think we were talking earlier why President Hadi, the elected president, fled. But, I mean, if the elected president flees to your country, um, and uh, throws himself on your mercy, uh, and Yemen is right there um, in the south, yes, the potential Vietnam, uh, what do you do about it? I mean, it seems to me they have no option but to go in in some way. I, I really wouldn't describe it as waging war on Yemen. Um, How would you I, describe it? Well, they, they're intervening in I mean, Yemen lands. for their... They're intervening in Yemen for their own interests. I myself think if they get a bit of land around Yemen where they can have their uh, man reinstalled, I don't, they, they don't imagine for a minute they're going to defeat the Houthis or anything like that. Uh, and nor do I imagine for a minute that the Houthis are seriously going to come across the border. Um, there may be skirmishes along the border, but the Houthis are no threat to Saudi Arabia. Um, I, I, I've been sort of hearing Saudi Arabia in peril for nearly 40 years now, since I first went to Saudi Arabia. It was supposed to be in peril in 1978, 79. Um, every few years, there's something happen which, which, which inclines Western commentators to say it's all about to crumble, uh, wait till the king dies and they won't know who to choose next, and what about the next generation, and all this sort of stuff. And in fact, the Saudis have got a, a system which works very well, very sophisticated system. Um, Safa doesn't agree with it, but it operates that country very well. And I'll stop at that point, and we, we can talk more about it as we go along. Let me get to you, Carol. 
it's going to be maybe boring for the audience because I think uh, it's not in peril either. I mean, the Al Saud have been around for two and a half centuries. There have been three Saudi states. They have been in dire straits before, but I'm always amazed by the elasticity of of the dynasty of always managing to bounce back. That's not to say it's not going to get messy. I think they could not stand by and do nothing about what was going on in Yemen, especially with border provinces like Najran and Asir, which are much closer to Yemen than to the rest of Saudi Arabia. Uh, what is interesting to watch is indeed how this is going to pan out internally in the Al Saud family with the two new Mohammeds of the second generation now posturing for pole position. I mean, I'm surprised that Mohammed bin Nayef let this adventurism happen because Mohammed bin Salman, what I hear, is a sort of a loose cannon, but he has at the moment the ear of the king. Okay, thank That's you very fine. much. And finally, oh, you, I, see, I mean, I don't know, from the outside, speaking much less knowledge than any of you, it seemed to me like a war of choice rather than a war of necessity. Uh, well, I'll come to Yemen. I think it's uh, more a, a war of desperation, um, uh, uh, and you know. Uh, so we can talk about Yemen. We can talk about Yemen all night. But I'll, I'll go back to the question about uh, in peril, Saudi Arabia in peril. I'm afraid I'm going to have to agree. You know, I, I want to disagree with the rest <laughs> of them. But I'm going to have to agree with somebody uh, because you know I, I see this as a sort of British diplomat. Uh, I served twice in Saudi Arabia, and each time I was there, um, Whitehall was telling us that. Saudi Arabia was about to uh, collapse, or the, you know, it, there was bound to be. Uh, it was almost a sort of dialectical argument. It was going to, it was going to collapse under its internal contradictions. Remember, that's when the Soviet Union was going to do that, which eventually did, of course. But uh, Saudi Arabia is slightly different. I mean, I think the problem Saudi Arabia ha is run by the Al Saud, who have uh, survival in their DNA, uh, and it's a very cautious, it's a very slow-moving uh, system. Uh, operates by consensus, but the times when they move quickly are when they're in peril. Uh, and if you go back, you know, you go back to the 60s when Nasserism was at, <laughs> at its height, and there was actually a, uh, the prospect of an Egyptian army on the borders in Yemen, threatening threatening the kingdom with a with a hopeless king, King Saud. Well, they moved quite quickly and got rid of that king, uh, and they they dealt with Nasserism. And then you know they put Faisal, Fa King Faisal came to, to to the fore, and then. He upset the uh, he upset the um, Islamists uh, and uh, uh, he was assassinated and then you had the uh, the siege of the Grand Mosque in Mecca, which uh, again was a real existential threat to the Al Saud, which they dealt with by becoming even more Islamic. They moved in the 1980s to you know become a very much more uh, the sort of conservative, uh, repressive, uh, Motawa-driven state that we kind of see today. That was a that was a response to. Uh, the siege of the Grand Mosque in Mecca, and in '91, when we had the invasion of uh, invasion of uh, Kuwait and uh, uh, the first Gulf War, and invasion of Saudi Arabia. In fact, you know, when uh, Osama bin Laden made that generous offer to defend the the kingdom, and they they picked the Americans. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, you, in the longer term, you might ask which was the right one, but it was clearly the right one at the time. Um, and so, you know, and each time, and we had coming more recently, uh, 2002, 2005, when you did have an existential threat from, from Al Qaeda in the kingdom, they brought Mohammed bin Nayef to the fore, the Minister of Interior, because his father was basically useless. Um, so, you know, they have moved quickly, and so they have a they have a, a, a history of doing just enough, just in time, uh, and there's no reason why that shouldn't continue. At some stage, it might fall apart. British ambassadors were always famous for when they left Saudi Arabia, their, their parting words to Whitehall, who'd been pressing them, saying you've, you've, you've essentially got it wrong, is I'll give this Al Saud another five years. <laughs> and that, they would put their neck on and give themselves another five years. And when I left in 98, I said, I'm going you know, to give them 10, because <laughs> uh, I think they'll be there for another 10. And in 2007, they sent me back. Well, we'll see then. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, and I left in, in, in 2010. I said, you know what? I'm going to give them another 10. Uh, so 2020, watch for 2020. But I would just put in a note of caution. Um, we failed. It, we did. You remember when the, the, one of the, our best allies in the, in, in, in the Middle East was Iran in the time of the, the Shah. And when we failed to see the overthrow of the Shah coming. 
and we did a big um, we, we did a big internal survey afterwards in the forum, a big internal debate about how did we get this wrong, why didn't we see this, and it haunts every you know I joined the foreign office in 1975, and this was always in the back of our head. Could we do we not see it? And one of the conclusions of that study was it wasn't a failure of analysis. We were out in the bazaars, we saw people, we could see everything. It was a failure of imagination was the conclusion. Uh, we failed to imagine what the Middle East would be like without the Shah. And so my note of caution about Saudi Arabia is let's not get hooked in to a failure of imagination because we can't think, because we don't like the look of the Middle East and we don't like the look of the Gulf without the al-Saud, um, let's not be, uh, let's not let our, uh, close off our imagination. So okay, so happen one day. Let, let's, let's leave the foreign policy stuff to the side for a bit and do, do a little more on, on the internal situation. So there are, we heard internal family struggles. There's an Al-Qaeda issue or a radical Islamist issue. And then there's a disillusioned population. I think you would take that view, Safa. So can you start us on that issue of how deep are the grievances of Saudis who are looking for work and looking for better government? I think, uh, well, we were talking about this as well, about uh, especially in the eastern province, uh, there has been a consistent uh, for over three years now of protests against the Saudi government, uh, which has been brutally shut down. Um, but also there are protests, very, very small ones in different areas as well. I, I think what Saudi Arabia has done really well, the government of Saudi Arabia has done really well, is uh, shut down dissent. Uh, make it a very high price to have dissent against the government, r regardless of the form of that dissent. And I think this is the, when we're talking about peril. I don't think it's we're talking collapse. We're talking peril. We're just talking about a different phase that Saudi Arabia has to deal with. And I think we are in a different phase of what Saudi Arabia has to deal with. And that, and that, and that opposition is, is sheer. It's liberal. What are the sources of it? Well. <laughs> Okay, well, it, in, in the eastern province, part of it is sectarian, as in because the Saudi government uh, does not allow for space for Shia to practice, but the, it's more complex than that. Uh, uh, Shiaism is one of the aspects uh, of why people went out to protest. Uh, to them, it's about oppression, it's about lack of jobs, a lack of economic development. It's, so it's much more uh, complicated than that. Shiaism is definitely part and parcel of why uh, the youth in Qatif and Awamiya feel disillusioned and feel oppressed. Uh, but I guarantee you, if those protests were consistently happening somewhere else in the country, w which is completely Sunni, the government would have cracked down on that as well. So the reaction of the government towards those protests are not not because they're Shia, oh my God, we have to shut them down, but because the government does not wish to have that kind of discourse with the people. But the grievances are very specific to the Shia of the Eastern Province because are they, they are, they, well, they are, because Why? they are discriminated against in the way that they... But that's they, not the, the only reason. No, so it may not protesting. be the only reason, but it is, it's why the general population in Saudi Arabia would not feel the same. Uh, as I would disagree because, with you. Because I think the actually... Okay, let me finish. I, well, I disagree with you first because... Well, Saudi you don't know what Arabia you're disagreeing with yet because I haven't told <laughs> you <laughs> that. <laughs> so, no, let us say a thing and then you can come back. <laughs> Saudi Arabian, the Saudi Arabian government succeeded in isolating the protests in Qatif by saying they're Shia, but saying they're Iranian stooges. And so even though the protests in Qatif started, why? Because they were asking for the release of political prisoners. The release of political prisoners in Saudi Arabia is a huge issue that nobody in Riyadh or in Jeddah or any Arabi Riyadh would disagree that it is not a huge issue in Saudi Arabia. Mu'taqaleen, it, everybody's talking about it. Everybody's talking about people being arrested, not taken to court, people being in jail for 16 years without knowing so it's not a Shia or Sunni thing. It became so later because they're the only ones who went out and protest consistently. So, please. Well, I think they go out and protest consistently because they are genuinely discriminated against. There are limits to what you can do as a Shia and where you can work. If you're a, if you're a Sunni, um, you have problems of unemployment and access, but not, not problem of access to education because you have education. You're basically co-opted. And that's why I think <coughs> it, it, ultimately the, the, the protests in the East are unlikely to spread because you have the, the population are co-opted. Uh, because actually, even though there are very few political rights in Saudi Arabia, social and economic rights are actually well served. If you, if you looked at a social and economic rights index, <coughs> Saudi Arabia would come pretty high versus a political rights index where they would, come, would become pretty low. Okay. So can I ask either of you two, do you see this 
uh, general disillusionment, these issues like imprisonment, lack of civil liberties, joblessness, do you see, do either of you two see those two, those sort of factors being a, an issue? Of course they're an issue. Um, but the thing is also that um, at the moment, Saudi Arabia is like those big banks, too big to fail. Um, and I think that is even the view of the population. They still have too much to lose um, to really rise up. I mean, there's sort of despair you see in Tunisia and Egypt and Syria and other places. And I think the, the Al Saud are masters and have been for 250 <laughs> years to, to play on it, doing the right thing just in brilliant at that. Uh, I, I'd like to tell a story because I'm really a storyteller rather than a historian or anything. But when I went to Katif and the eastern province for the <laughs> festival of Ashura, which um, <coughs> most of you will know is, is the high point of the, the, the Shia year, uh, and or the low point, depending on your point of view, because it's when they commemorate um, the, the great tragedy um, of, of, of their hero being slain. And um, I went there with some other Saudi journalists, um, not sponsored by the government in any way. We were all with Arab News in Jeddah. We decided we'd fly over to see what's happening at Ashura. Um, what year was this? Um, this would have been about 2007 or 8. And um, we, we, uh, um, we, we could go freely wherever we wanted. And I, I do insist, we, you know, uh, there was no Saudi minders or anything with us. We decided we'd like to go and see what was going on in the villages. And every village we came to, there was a checkpoint around it of Saudi soldiers. Um, and we had to show our journalistic credentials or passports and everything. Once it was clear that we were foreigners and not Saudis, not Sunnis, we went in. And every village we went into, there they all were, going around the square, whacking themselves with the chains, um, howling, I mean, g going through these sheer rituals which are so offensive to, to, to Sunnis. Um, the climax of, of the week was in the main football stadium at Katif, where 10, 15, 20,000 um, Shia men and women and children all gathered to watch um, a reenactment of the great battle. What's the name of the battle? Karba in Karbala. Yeah, Karbala. Yeah. The great battle. Um, it was like the reenactment of Waterloo. Um, uh, you know, there were the troops and riding, and they, they, they were surrounded by the wicked enemy and so on, and everybody cried and so on. Anyway, the point of all this is that here were, within these Saudi government um, networks, the Shia um, uh, following their rituals, going through, as I say, these things that are of such to um, Sunnis, you know, the sort of thing that happened that story, you know, I, I was taken to a Shia graveyard and there I saw um, cans of Pepsi Cola and uh, 7-Up and so on on the ground and was told, you know, that's where my grandfather is. You know, because you know, I'm sure you know, the, 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 the wish of the Shia to erect monuments to their dead is deeply offensive to the Sunnis. So, all they can do in their graveyards is, is, is throw all bottles and, and, and cans down to show where their where they're dead are buried. Because as you know, the Sunnis are exactly the opposite. Nobody knows now where King Abdul is buried or King Fahad. They're just thrown in a common graveyard. Um, and so the Shia are, are driven to this. And then at night, the, the Sunnis come into the graveyard and move the bottles around um, so that people can't tell where they're. I mean, this is the level of um, deep antagonism that there is, and I would simply, um, and I'll stop, my, my point is simply that the Saudi government, which are always portrayed as the aggressors in this, play a very important role in shielding these Shia, the large Shia population, from uh, uh, mayhem that would result if the, 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 the Sunnis around them um, uh, had their way. OK, I'm going to move it on. I know you probably want to say something, but let's move it on to the, uh, the second challenge I mentioned, so internal family struggle. You know, there's always talk about succession issues and uh, problems within the family. Uh, how real are those? And are they, with this new monarch, is that, is that how big an issue is that? You briefly touched on it, so let's have everyone else on that. What, 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 
Well, I mean, I think there's always a there's almost a maneuvering when the new, uh, when a king comes. You know, uh, king dies. When King Fahad died, the sons of Fahad were less prominent, and, and indeed through through quite a while through Abdullah's uh, reign, the, his sons were he took quite a while to get rid of uh, Muhammad bin Fahad in the eastern province, and the same has happened to Abdullah's sons. Although Miteb bin Abdullah has been left in place, some of the other sons have just moved aside. I frankly think the same will happen to Salman's sons uh, when he's no longer king. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman may, if he's competent, uh, may, may succeed in a way that Mohammed bin Naif has succeeded because, he's, because of his competence. His father never became king. Indeed, he was promoted despite his father because of his competence. Um, and uh, he, he, he was, uh, was favoured by King Abdullah. So there is a lot of manoeuvring uh, happening in Saudi Arabia. It takes a while to settle down uh, while, the, uh, while the, um, the, various, uh, the various factions. But I think, you know, Mohammed bin Naif has been identified. And I think it's quite a bold move by, uh, uh, by King Abdullah before he died to nominate him as the sec second uh, uh, de de deputy Pr minister, basically crown prince in waiting. Be very difficult for, um, I don't think he would do it, frankly, King Migrin, who would, who would come after mm -hmm. King Salman, to, uh, to push him aside. So that kind of succession, I think Mohammed bin Salman, in the longer term, will have to get on with Mohammed bin Nayef, because otherwise he will find himself out in the cold. So you're uh, saying it's manageable, this sort of... I think it's, I think, I I think think it's very manageable, but I, I, I'd just like to disagree with one thing, is that I do not think there will be a King Migrin. Uh, from what I hear... Um, uh, Mugrin, whom I've met and greatly respect, a hard-working, rather bright man, former um, fighter pilot, trained in this country, the only Saudi prince I ever met at half past seven in the morning, um, all re ready to go and, uh, and uh, talk. Um, uh, but he's, he doesn't have legitimacy in the family. As you know, um, his mother is not from the Al Saud or from any tribe. She's a slave. She's a Yemeni slave. Um, uh, and uh, it was always said that he would never become uh, king, and he was sort of spatchcocked in there by um, Abdullah, uh, uh, as you say. But uh, it's been remarkable, from what I can discover, you know, with this coming and going over the Yemeni war, um, with uh, uh, the, the American Secretary of State and so on, none of them have gone to see Mugran. They've only seen the king, and then they've seen Mohammed bin uh, Naif. Um, and what I hear is that, um, you know, in, in the course of, and, and if you see pictures of the receptions, he's sort of on the outside, look, sort of, uh, he want, you know, when, when, when the president of Yemen came. It would be in. unprecedented to set aside a crown prince who's had the bayah, uh, who's been endorsed he, by, the, by the basic law, uh, by the, it will by be the constitution. It would be unprecedented. But I mean, he, I know Mugrim very well, yeah. and, he, 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 and if you to, uh, and if we've been having this conversation before, He'd been made crown prince yeah. before he'd uh, had the yeah. oath of allegiance, yeah. before it had all been formalized. I would have agreed with you. He yeah. seems a very unlikely king. He's yeah. too nice. But I just think it would create, <laughs> it would create a, a huge. Um, a, 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 a well, huge I think he will problem. do it. On, I think he will do it of his own accord. Um, and he'll be given the job of head of the family council and that sort of thing, so that Mohammed. Um, uh, uh, bin Naif can come in. I, I'd just like to say one other quick thing, because this is another story, but I think you'll find it interesting, about Mohammed bin Salman. Are people aware of why Mohammed bin Salman has suddenly become so important? No? no. Mohammed bin Salman is the youngest son, of, just about the youngest son, isn't he, of King Salman? Um, rather aggressive, unpleasant character until recently. Uh, he, he lost a court case o over land in Riyadh and was said to have sent the, the judge who ruled against him a letter with a bullet inside it. Um, he's not said to be dreadfully popular with his much older and more sophisticated brothers, but he has an immense capacity for hard work. And why I'd slightly delay you with the story is because it seems to me to say something very interesting about Saudi Arabia. He, he gained his power through being his father's right-hand man when Salman was still governor of Riyadh four, five, six years ago. And uh, the, the Saudi Majlis has become rather a corrupt institution. Not, not, when I say it's debased, not corrupt. Uh, you know the Majlis is the traditional forum in which people sit and talk with their prince. It's always described by the Saudis as our own desert democracy. 
Well, it's not really. Um, and what it is, is more like a sort of citizen's advice bureau meeting. And you must have done many of these, William. Everybody sits, of course men, I say, men sit and talk with their prince. And all the princes do it, and all the governors do it, several times a week. Um, and they all sit and they have their coffee. And then, about 100 or so of them, and then it comes time to say goodbye. And everybody walks up to the prince with their piece of paper. And they shake hands with the prince and they give it to him. And Saudi princes are so used to people waving pieces of paper in their face that when a friend of mine, bright young student, went, went to meet King Abdullah because he'd done particularly well at university and he'd made a few comments on a piece of paper um, so that he, he, he didn't miss his opportunity to make the points he wanted to, the moment Abdullah saw the piece of paper, he reached out for it because he assumed it was a petition. And all this paper creates a big problem because the prince gets it, he looks at it, then he gives it to the man next door to him, and he then promptly entered it in a ledger. And by the end of the meeting, you've got 130 pieces of paper and 130 citizens who've shaken hands and gone away and expect to come back next day to know what's... They, they get given a re receipt. They then go and get a receipt for their piece of paper, and they expect results. And it turned out that Mah Mohammed uh, bin Salman um, has a great aptitude for going through bits of paper. And if you give Mohammed bin Salman a, piece, a pile of paper, um, he will not stop until he's taken every piece and gone to the bottom. Um, and this is a very useful characteristic because I'd like to hear William's view on this, but King Salman is definitely showing his age. Some people say he's got dementia. Some people say he's got early, no, it can't be early Alzheimer's, late Alzheimer's, I don't know. Um, but he certainly seems towards the end of the day to be flagging and losing mental powers. And in this young man, who's so willing to do all his hard work, he has someone who has sort of replaced his brain or um, um, uh, a support to his memory. Um, and so I make no comment on whether Mohammed bin Fad as Salman is any good as a defense minister um, or as gatekeeper to his father. But that is why this young man, very interesting, we don't know his exact age. Some people say he's in his late 20s, some people say his mid-30s. Uh, that's the reason why this, he, he's sort of like an adjunct to Salman, okay. and we should just have to see what happens. Sorry. Very interesting. Okay, uh, before we get to you, can we, have you got any views on the royal family issue? I think all of this conversation is irrelevant right. to any Saudi citizen. I mean, because I ultimately... I could not disagree more. Let me finish. <laughs> well, all right. <coughs> I, I mean, think irrelevant me... is rather a large word to use. I yeah. mean, the country is a family business run by the family. I listen to you, so you have to listen All to right, me. All right, certainly. Good Saudi As tradition. As a Saudi citizen. Yes, thank you. Yes, which you are not. No. Uh, so I find it problematic with all this conversation about whose house is in control and what prince is doing what. Ultimately, as a, on the receiving end of this institution, it, the problem is this whole thing of describing uh, the really demeaning thing of taking the paper and asking for a favor. The problem is the lack of institutions in the country that makes citizens have to do this. This is the basic problem in Saudi Arabia right now, where there is no accountability to the institutions themselves. There is no direct way for the citizen to be involved directly and in what happens in the government, how to change things, reform, all these things. And I find it really, to me, it's like, who's the prince at the time? When the institution is the same, we're still dealing with a monarchy. So to me, the real, the real issue of what we're facing right now in Saudi Arabia is how to change the conversation between the people and the government. And that is a crucial issue to answer about what's going to happen to Saudi Arabia in the next five or ten years. So it doesn't matter to me who's the prince and what position. What really matters to me is there going to be an institutional dramatic change in the country that will allow the citizens to be able to directly implement change in the country. So we can talk about all these princes and who's more effective in taking papers or whatever, but to me that's completely irrelevant. I find that really objectionable. Okay, well, no, where else in the Middle East is there a country run by its citizens? 
What are you talking about? We're not talking about Hampstead. But we're talking. We're we, talking. This is the talking point of are, everybody since 2011. Okay, no, no. Of we need to change that conversation in the Middle East. Well, we need so to. you glorifying that as a I'm it's, not it's glorifying terrible. it. I'm stating a reality. As a, as a diplomat, can I come in the yes, middle sir. here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think. I think. I think what Robert is describing is the situation as is. I think what Safa is describing is the situation as she would like it to be. And I don't think Robert's trying to say this is a great system. I think he's explaining what it is. Nobody's going to disagree with your system. Uh, I, would, I would just I don't have a system. I'm no, saying no, this, no, is, no, this nobody's is the conversation nobody's that nobody's disagreeing Saudis the ordinary are having Saudi, about no, nobody's, Nobody should disagree yeah. the ordinary Saudis. Yeah. Uh, I suppose the question I would ask is, what are ordinary Saudis, who, and I have these conversations with ordinary Saudis, uh, uh, they, they, they're very liberal, they, it's a question what they're prepared to do about it uh, and how they're going to change. And I actually take the view that the Arab Spring, interestingly, has made Saudis less likely to willing to take a chance on something More else. Scared. Because if you, look yeah. at, if you look at the sort of different trends, uh, liberal Saudis, which I would put you in the category of liberal, all my liberal Saudi friends are a bit worried about what would happen after the Al Saud? So there's lo different groups of people who see the Al Saud as their as their protector, because what they see as coming after the Al Saud is probably the sort of chaos that you well, might find elsewhere. Well, this is all the dictators are going to say is either me or chaos. Well, look what happened when the dictators left. David Cameron is might win an election on that. Do you, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you accept that that is that is? I mean, as much as you regret it, it's on the record. that in fact most people don't. Unfortunately, this is not funny. That what? people are paying a price for the chaos that's happening. Now. Yeah, but because yeah. we in the West, bringing in our concern for human rights, thought we would, you know, get rid of Libya. We, we invaded Iraq in the name of human rights. No, and what happened? 110,000 people there <laughs> lost their basic human right, which yeah, is their which lives. Is, which is not so, funny. So, yeah. you know, just to shuffle these countries around to suit our Western liberal ideas, wait, wait. I think it's well, very, very dangerous. Well, two different things. What you do in the West is irrelevant. Yeah, we're talking about how people in the Arab world are having discussions and people are paying a price for trying to change their governments. The role of the West in what's happening in the Middle East is a very valid conversation. But I am talking about the people in the Middle East having that conversation and being killed because of, that, because of the weapons that you They're not getting killed given. in Saudi Arabia for it. No, they're not? <coughs> no. Hello? They are not seriously? getting killed. Quite seriously. You should pr provide the evidence. The cemetery, the Shia cemetery that you've described, those are is demonstrators full of them. who go out in the street and they get oh, shot. And they deserve to be killed. I'm not saying they deserve to be shot. You just said that there are no ones Let's who were killed. On well, what are we talking about? 20, 30, 40 last year? How many? Oh, so that's okay. Well, compared to the other countries in the Middle East, it is nothing. It is absolutely nothing compared to Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Libya. Look at the okay. tens of thousands that have been killed there. Great, so they're worthless. Oh. They're not worthless. Don't no, no, exaggerate, no, 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 no. please. Okay. That is really a demeaning, a patronizing thing to say. What you just said. No, I am not patronizing. A life is a life. Hold on. Exactly, a life is a life. They well, fought, the and they fought for something they believed in. Of, I am a Saudi who has the right to go out on the street well, and try to change something. You what are you saying about if they're 10 and 20, that is irrelevant to you? It's not because irrelevant. Of Syria or in the scale of things. We understand your points of view. <laughs> uh, can you comment on the? Uh, let, let's just move this on, actually, <laughs> to, to, to uh, the radical Islamist challenge. How real is it? Has it been defeated? Is it over? Is it still there? It has been quite real, I think. I mean, uh, just after I left Saudi Arabia, things were happening uh, I wouldn't have thought possible in the 90s. There's no country I felt safer in than Saudi Arabia throughout the 90s. And when you get indeed, you know, attacks on compounds and expats being held hostage, BBC correspondents shot point blank in the streets, you couldn't imagine that in the 90s. So it was at that point, uh, point also that I thought, uh, n now it's ripping at the seams and, and something is going to change. Twelve years later, they're building skyscrapers. Sky is the limit still in Saudi Arabia. So. The difference, I think, with a lot of the surrounding countries is that it, it, it's not a single dictator, even with a family or an extended family. It's a dynasty of 3,000 potential pretenders to the throne. And the country is not called Saudi Arabia for nothing. It's a Saudi state. There is no Saudi nation. That's the problem. To my mind, Saudi Arabia is at least five countries in, because of regional and ethnic differences internally. 
and the El Saud have capitalized on that. The only one who hold it together is it's thanks to us that this works and we have oil and everybody benefits to a degree. So it's not a single figure. Soloists will not be tolerated. Mohammed bin Salman will not be allowed to play the prima donna because the Al Saud are a tribe and there is the tribe and the tribe. On the oil tribe. which you mentioned, how exaggerated are the reserves and is this not an unsustainable system which requires people to be bought off year on year, tens of billions spent more and more every time there's a problem? Is that an unsustainable system? Well, eventually it is. I mean, these oil reserves run out, but they keep discovering new resources and the technology improves also that it remains sustainable. And if it's $100 a barrel, there is huge quantities that become economically viable. They have, they have as much proven reserves now as Saudi Arabia. The three Saudi states that we have had historically have been in existence. So it's a bit of a bucrafi mission. I mean, I was in Saudi in the late 90s when oil went down <coughs> to $8 a barrel and Saudi was running huge deficits, mm. running a deficit of 100% you know, of GDP. So, uh, and was, you know, they were, they were borrowing. They were borrowing Again. So there have been times in Saudi Arabia where they haven't had vast surpluses. They have built up uh, you know, the 600, million, uh, dollar, 600 billion dollar surplus. Uh, so even at their current level of spending, which I don't think will be sustained if the oil price you know, stays around 50, 60 dollars, which is you know, who, who's going to predict the oil price? But that seems more likely longer term price than 110 dollars. Um, they, they, they could sustain their current um, uh, deficit uh, for another 10 years without adjustment. But they will adjust. Because if you look at what they're doing at the moment, they are, you know, they're, they're funding Egypt, they're, f they're funding Yemen, they're, 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 tr they're funding Jordan. Yeah, but my question is, if they, st if they do adjust and they <laughs> stop the payout to the population, they stop <laughs> buying off the population, does that become a, does that become a problem? Oh, well, it could be, but I don't think they'll do that. I don't think they'll get to a stage where they stop free education, <coughs> they stop uh, free health, they stop providing. You know, there is the, the problem for the Saudis and what the Saudis worry about. When I talk to the Saudi finance minister, what he worries about <coughs> is not the absolute poverty. They, 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 have, they, do the, they do their own, they do their own analysis. Uh, and so I don't know what the current figures are, but when, when I was there in, in 2710, they had a figure of 2% of Saudis were in absolute poverty. You know, uh, and those they could deal with. They could give them money. They worried about the 20% who were in relative poverty. Uh, so they had a house, they had a, they had a job, they had a car, they'd been educated, they had free health. But they, compared with the rest of their citizens, they looked, they looked poor. So that group of 20%, uh, if, if things got worse, that could get bigger. And I mean, I think what you need to think about Saudi Arabia, there's no one thing that would bring it down. It would be a combination of factors, the perfect storm. It would, there would have to be the threat from political Islam, a, a division within the Al Saud itself. I think that would be the crucial thing. Without a division in the Al Saud, I, don't, I, I, I think that the Al Saud would handle this. A regional crisis, an economic crisis, all of those things together could produce Saudi Arabia in peril, but any one of them isn't enough. There's another group you have to pay attention to. I mean, it's, it will not be sectarianism. There's too few Shiites. It doesn't matter to the vast majority. It will not be radical Islam because contrary to the image you get of Saudi Arabia of this pious and austerely Islamic country, most Saudis are, you know, really normal people with the same concerns, concerns like everybody else. What, what I'm very interested in, and that group at the moment still has probably too much invested still in its relationship with the dynasty is the economic elite, the big business families, because they, they cannot develop within Saudi Arabia to the extent um, it is possible in other economies. I mean, strategic parts of the economy are fenced off. Airlines, the oil companies, they, they're sort of, you know, super group super grocers. You can have your Toyota agency and things like that. But these families are extremely wealthy and I think there must be something brewing among them. They're very well educated and very well connected and cosmopolitan as well. That I think the change is going to be there. If that group grows to, and I don't know what percentage you would need, but these are also people capable of being change makers. Right, you know, you've got no particular evidence that it's happening, but you just think it it could. I think the issue of corruption is a really big issue in mm. Saudi Arabia. 
And I think the, the less that this kind of class, the middle class, the upper middle class, when they feel like it is becoming really difficult for them. I mean, we're talking about like, for example, infrastructure, the corruption in just building roads or hospitals, or now we're talking about public transportation, which is almost <coughs> non-existent in Saudi Arabia in general. And so those kind of things will push yeah. everybody that is considered the middle class. can also not invest that. in that. Yeah. That's exactly the point, yes. you know? It is a government thing, mm. they take the kickbacks. These big business families have to give kickbacks to the royal family to be allowed this or that. And there is and going to be a And also they're held responsible when they yes. don't deliver. So they, at they, the moment, they're, catch 22. they're still too much in cahoots with the royal family. But that's going to change at some point. OK, so what we're going to do, I'll, I'll, I'll ask questions from the floor. I think the one way to do this is to aim them at a specific person, because then we avoid <laughs> having everyone answering and everything. You don't get many questions in, because normally there are more questioners than, uh, than, than, than time. So if you can aim your questions, that would be good. There is a roving mic. Yeah, at the back. Hello. I, uh, we were discussing Saudi Arabia today uh, with some colleagues, and none of us know a huge amount. But one question that came to mind was with the bombing campaign in Yemen, uh, it seems that the um, Al Al-Qaeda uh, on the ground uh, gay, uh, you know, got new opportunities to expand their territories. And the question is, do you think the new Osama bin Laden is possible? What do you mean by new Well, Osama? is it possible that a new Osama bin Laden will emerge from is that Al Qaeda and, you know, the. Is the he necessary? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not, but that was the okay, question well, that came so, to so, us. So, so is, is Al Qaeda in Yemen going to be able to make an impact in, in Saudi? I don't, I don't know if they're interested, but now they're in control of Mokella, for example, and Hadramot. So they are definitely expanding. Uh, whether they will try to. Uh, expand within Yemen first before they even try to. I, I don't think their agenda is Saudi Arabia necessarily at the moment. I mean, th I think they're busy with the Houthis. Right. Any other views on that? Well, um, no, I, I, I think Al Qaeda's ultimate aim, surely, objective is is the House of Saud, just as the Caliphate would you know would like to get rid of these people who usurped um, uh, the, the, the holy places and. Many, surely, many of the members you mean short of short term or long term. Well, it's what their stated objective is. I mean, I, I want to hear much more from you, Safa, about what's going on in Yemen because you've been there and, and you know a lot about it. But the only thing I can contribute to this is that that I know, I'm sure you know, that a lot of the members of um, Al Qaeda in Yemen are in fact originally Saudis, yeah, aren't they? Yeah. And uh, quite a lot of them are actually, well, not quite a lot, but a large, well, a certain number of them are graduates of the Saudi re-education program for terrorists, which I made a film about, about yes. how well it was working. <laughs> and then um, um, half the guys, that, well, no, no, none of the guys, I, the guys I interviewed are still there. But I mean, quite a number of the graduates from this program who were much praised buggered <laughs> off to Yemen, where, um, you know, they are <coughs> Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. So. Um, yeah. Um, Al Qaeda is clearly a long term threat. Yeah. Hi, thanks all for everything, all your opinions. Um, I have a question about basically the title of this whole panel was Saudi Kingdom in Peril. And the question idea mark. of. Pardon? Question mark. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry. <laughs> when I thought Kingdom in Peril, the first thing that kind of came to my mind was when oil runs out and the Saudis can't take care of their people anymore since they don't pay taxes because the government doesn't want them to have a say in what the government does. Um, what's, what's going to happen? I feel like that would be the point where people would rise up because they wouldn't be being taken care of by the government anymore and suppressed by the government anymore. Okay, well let's try and put a t time scale on that given, uh, I mean, the one thing Well, 2050, 2050, nobody thinks oil is going to run out. Uh, it's certainly Saudi Arabia, or they all won't run out. What they're worried about is I stop using it. Uh, I, I remember giving a presentation in Saudi Arabia, I got them really worried where Shell, Shell did a presentation and they basically said, we didn't run out of coal, we just stopped using it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what they'd worry about, uh, they, they'd yeah. stop using it. But, uh, Saudi Arabia will have enough reserves, as long as we're using oil, They'll be they'll be producing it because they they ha they are the lowest producer in the world, and we could do so. What they're worried about, and, and the reason they won't uh, cut production to put price up, is his market share. Have you ever? You can find all sorts of experts pontificating about what Saudi Arabia is doing about oil, trying to screw the Iranians or do this or do that. Actually, what they're trying to do is to save market share. So up to 2050, it's more likely the price will determine 
uh, how much money they have. Um, and they are trying to diversify. And I think there could be a race between can they diversify quickly enough to satisfy the aspirations of all the young people, you know, the, the stuff I was talking even about. even more than that. I think it's the functionality of the state, how functional it is, how much of the basic services in Saudi Arabia they'll be able to, to deal with. I mean, I think the corruption is one of the biggest, biggest issues that every Saudi wouldn't, wouldn't disagree that corruption is one of the biggest issues that is facing mm. Saudi Arabia. So it's not sectarian, right? Because the, uh, mm. the Shia are minorities, not all, any of these things. It's how functional is the state and what are the expectations of the people and the government of each other? And I think that is not re really relevant of oil, well, but rather allocation of resources within the country. Well, once again, I'd like to disagree with Safa. Um, <laughs> I don't know if any of you saw this play at the National Theatre. Um, about the poor Indians living uh, in the shadow of Bombay Airport. Mm -hmm. And I was absolutely horrified by the corruption that I saw depicted in that play. And I said to my Indian friends, this cannot be true. Um, the moment somebody made just a few, few, few rupees from, from saving bottles, um, the police were on them, they wanted a share of this. And they were, it, it, it was terrifying. And all my Indian friends said, no, that's how it is. Now, that is not how Saudi Arabia is. People are always talking about corruption in Saudi Arabia, but the public services that I had to deal with, you'll say I'm a foreigner, but the, the ordinary, the, the, the ordinary Saudi, the, the, there's a remarkable decency I find in, in Saudi Arabia. And really, look at our, look at, look at Britain if you want to look at corruption. Um, uh, look at the corruption in America, look at the corruption in France. I, 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 I was not conscious among the Saudis that I, 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 I mingled with. The, the, the corruption is the burning issue that, that you're presenting. But you're both against. right. You're both right because the corruption starts at a much higher level. Um, they, don't have pet they don't have the same level of petty. I was in Afghanistan where corruption is everything. Okay. And I used to have a conversation with President Karzai. It's uh, something like this. Do you know what you should aspire to, President Karzai? It's the Saudi system where the elite... <laughs> <laughs> absolutely true. Where the elite take 25% off the top and the other 75% goes into the budget and filters down, which is what happens in Saudi. The 25% is taken off uh, by, by the royal family in one way or another. But actually, quite a lot of it, three quarters of it, goes in through the system. Now, obviously, there's you, uh, how that is then allocated is often subject to less than transparent processes. Um, but you know, there is a kind of, and I think that's one of the strengths in the Saudi system. And if that comes under challenge, if the royal family grows too big, and the, uh, the, 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 the amount of money to be shared, the, if the cake gets smaller, then the pressures will increase. The pressures will increase. But while there's still a lot, I mean, Saudi Arabia is one of the least corrupt countries I've served in. I'll tell you the, the list I've served in, Libya, Sudan, Iraq, Afghanistan. <laughs> Maybe a bit more corrupt Beautiful than Australia. List. A bit more, corru <laughs> bit, bit more corrupt than Australia. I'll give the Australians <laughs> some credit. But it's probably one of the least corrupt of the countries I've been around. That doesn't mean to say it's not corrupt. Yeah, question. Uh, this question is to Um I'm originally from Libya. Probably four years ago, I was sitting in the same place and we used to say, Qaddafi, please go. And we wanted an ideal system with, with democracy and everything. And we still do. Uh, don't get me wrong. But if you ask the majority of... I think the Libyans of and Saudis have a lot in common. A lot, of co a lot in common, yeah. If you ask the majority of Libyans today, they call Muammar a martyr. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Once upon a time, they used to Allah call him a dictator. <laughs> Allah yarham. Well, that's exactly what... <laughs> That's exactly what they are saying. In Iraq, they say that about Saddam Hussein. And they're saying right? that about uh, Iraq as well. Is that a vision you see for Saudi Arabia? Or are you aspiring for change to come within more than change to be enforced in a quick, fast, and messy way like we had? And I really, uh, I really wish it doesn't happen to you. It's every Arab country that, uh, that, that would happen from the outside. I think that this is, this is my, my fear and critique of... When, when all dissent inside the country is silenced, then there is very little space to have that kind of reform and that kind of conversations. So the worst case scenario is to have the, the, the change from the outside, because that's not real change. That, that's not going to happen. I mean, the, the, what, I was in Tripoli, and I was in Benghazi before 
before Qaddafi fell. <coughs> and I could see the similarities between the Libyan and the, and the Saudi people. But also the, 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 the problem is when you have a lack of NGOs, civil society, when people are not used to uh, forming unions and all these things. So you're enabled, like when, when Qaddafi fell, I mean, what we had is what? Militias actively, right? And so, you, but you had very little civil society on the ground that could pick up the pieces, that could, that could build something more cohesive that would end up being a government. So I think not just me, I think every Saudi looks around them and they're scared shitless about what could possibly happen if they fell apart. Like that, that is not a scenario that I think anybody wants. And so the, the, it's, yes, I mean... The I, I, I used to work in Saudi yeah. and uh, Saudi have, you have a much, much more mature built system than yeah. we ever had. I mean, Qaddafi did uh, I mean, quite a job. Well, we, he, he did a good job there. Yeah, yeah. No, he did okay. do a good job. I mean, can, 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 yeah. I'll come to you. Can I, can I just start, ask yeah. you, with, you know, what do you think of that view that civil society organization within Saudi allowing dissent, allowing voices to develop would be... A healthy progress? A healthy thing. And, that, and um, uh, this is an unconventional view of mine, which... Um, uh, I actually see in the development of the social media uh, in, in, in Saudi um, a real way ahead. And one of the odd things about Saudi Arabia is that it is the most tweeted country in the whole world. I don't know if that's the word. There are, there are the most Twitter owners, holders, Twitterers. And in, YouTube. I, I, yeah. Sorry? And YouTube. Users. And YouTube too. And uh, uh, one could talk a long time about this, but I, I have come to feel that... Um, this is creating a sort of e e electronic majlis in the country. There is an incredible debate going on. You get members of the royal family who tweet, who reveal stories of corruption um, and, and the politics in the royal family. A lot of the grievances Safa is talking about get, get aired. Um, this is sort of tokenism, but um, uh, last week, the viral, the viral um, s storm of the moment was, was pictures of um, a man in a shop, man and woman working alongside, um, strangely, in Jeddah, and he slapped the woman and hit her on the ground, um, and she then got up and went after him. Um, and as a result of this, the local governor, uh, Carla Del Faisal, intervened and got the man arrested. Now, you know, it's a small thing, but it, it, it shows the way in which uh, the, Al the Al Saud, I'm sure, could take steps to stop this debate that's going on, but I find it's quite a healthy debate. And what was it happened yesterday? A prince went on television and, and insulted um, non-white soccer players, called them tarsh, rubbish, tarsh or bahat, rubbish yeah. from the sea. Yeah. And um, Salman promptly, you know, the king himself promptly said, well, you know, this is not good enough. You're not allowed on television anymore. He sacked him from whatever positions he had. Now, the, 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 I'm not presenting these in any way. As a, as a substitute for democracy. But there are, I think, odd ways that Saudis live with this system and actually influence it to okay. some degree. There's a comment from here before we go to the next question. Yeah, I, I think it is unprecedented how social media are now allowed to function if you compare it indeed before these, uh, these technologies came in. In the 90s, Saudi media were painfully boring. Um, at the same time, you toe a very fine line in using that, and uh, the, the government, the system, you know, the regime is very good at, at giving these these signals. Um, one of my PhD students from Saudi Arabia is doing his PhD on this oh. this Twitter thing. Um, when Hamza Kashgari did the tweets on a fictitious. Mm -hmm. conversation he had with the prophet he was hunted down in Malaysia yeah. extradited and put in jail so the signal is you can tweet oh. you can get things off your chest but don't push it too far right. so social they, media yeah. are also really easy to track down which is very convenient for but security. could I just say a word about Hamza Kashgari because I know his parents and Hamza Kashgari was a young man who as you say tweeted a sort of debate with the prophet Prophet, I don't know if I love you or I hate you. I love you because of this. I hate you because of that. He, was, he, he acted out the <coughs> conflicting feelings of his faith, and it infuriated the Twitter community. Within a day, there were 30,000 calls for his death. He made the mistake of fleeing the country and going to Malaysia, an Islamic country, and got brought back. Uh, he got put in prison in solitary confinement. 
But my friend, who's a graduate of, you know, uh, of, the, uh, of the University of Petroleum and Minerals, got a call from the government saying, Would you, we're, we're going to fly you up to Riyadh to see your son. So he and his wife went up to see him. He was there, isolated in prison, but being protected from the wrath of the other prisoners. Because if he wasn't isolated, they would have torn him limb from limb. He did two years, maybe three years, in prison in that way, being protected, and has quietly been let out now. now that seems to me an example of what I was talking about earlier, a very fundamentalist society, but a government with, with, with more humane sensibilities than they're given credit but for. But I think Let's it's strange that you say that, because you use that as protecting okay. Qatif with checkpoints, when I think any Qatifi would disagree with you that they are being protected from the Sunnis, well, rather yeah. than being okay. held okay. in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, yeah, question here. Um, I just had a quick question on internal governance. So Salman and the new royal court seem to have moved quite quickly, both on the displacement of the sons of Abdullah, but also to dissolve a lot of the existing governing committees and to replace quite a few of the ministers. You know, we're now on our second health minister in, in as many months. Um, what do you make of some of the day-to-day -day kind of government and government's choices that have been made over the course of the last kind of 100 days? Well, I mean, I think I think it's kind of you know the government gets very sclerotic committees it wasn't really functioning. I think in uh, Abdullah's final days, Abdullah wasn't making many decisions. Um, <coughs> they were being <coughs> made for him. Um, so what you see is the advisors around Abdullah, the Tawajris, basically moving aside. And I think the moves are, tend to be about efficiency of government decision making. The key ministers have stayed the same: Minister of Finance, Minister of Oil. Uh, Minister, of you know, Minister of Defence changed, Minister of Interior stays. So Minister of Labour stays. Mi well, I'm not sure these are key ministries. It's very important. Well, you know, the, the Minister for Saudiization, which has achieved nothing over 20 years, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I disagree with you. All right, very right, good, good. Excellent, excellent. That's good. I mean, that would be very good. But I, I think it's more about, you know, uh, Changing pe the big stuff is you know Mohammed bin uh, Salman being in there and uh, the head of the uh, the, the, the <coughs> economic committee uh, and on the security committee and then giving Mohammed bin Nayef the security committee so you've got two big committees of government and uh, so I think uh, I think it's too early to say what you know what, what the impact it strikes me as the the usual manoeuvring uh, and it's slightly more stark this time because remember when Fahad Fahad was in a coma for about 10 years before he actually died. So you basically had the king and the crown prince uh, ruling but not reigning. So the transition there was less, less stark and it was more nuanced because Abdullah still was, the, the, the Fahad's son still had some, uh, and his brother still had some say. I think this, this, this transition is, is starker because it's more, more direct. So I think, you know, I, I, I'm not reading too much into it. Okay, thank you. And uh, yes, you, and then if you can pass uh, the microphone down when you're done. Dan. I have a quick yeah. question for yeah. Safa. Um, what views of the Saudi citizens do you think your views uh, represent? I mean, I've spent some time in Saudi, and, and most Which people views? are reasonably, I found, conservative, and if pushed, would stick with the status quo. Uh, your views seem to want to a uh, Western style change. That's and, not I, true. and I'm not yeah. sure. And do you think the country is ready for that? And do you think there's any one better place to push through reforms than the Al Saud family? Yeah. I, I think uh, I will connect it to what the Libyan uh, was saying that everybody in Saudi Arabia is very aware of what would happen if the House of Saud no longer exists. Like, that is <coughs> the worst most scary scenario people have. And so the question is, everybody wants reform, but not to the extent of actually not having the royal family, because nobody has a replacement for the royal family. So nobody is suggesting that realistically in, when they're talking about reform. So everybody wants to push for reform within that system. But this, the thing that people who are actually a human rights activist or a political activist, what they're saying is when the government is closing down all the doors for actual peaceful re uh, reform, then you're opening the door for other people who are more extreme than that. So everybody 
is asking that question right now of how do we have more reform than we have right now, but not to come to the point where we're Libya or Syria or Yemen, because those are not the scenarios that Saudis want. And so uh, it, it's, it's a tricky balance right now. N nobody really knows wh where, where to go with that because, I mean, Al-Qahtani, Al-Hamid, people who are not even Shia activists uh, are in jail right now with 10, uh, with 10 year sentences. So th there, there are serious debates inside Saudi Arabia uh, right now about how to do that reform and, and uh, how to gauge that without ending up in prison. Yeah? Sorry, can I just briefly disagree? Um, the, uh, you know, I knew Mohammed Qatani, he was a great friend of mine. Uh, when he tweeted, you know, he built up before the time he went into prison 400, 500,000 followers. Um, uh, another friend in Jeddah I had who did six months in jail, he got up to 300, 400,000 followers. But these followings are nothing compared to what the fundamentalist preachers in Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. get. And if you're interested in how representative Safa is, she, she does represent an important element in Saudi Arabia. But if you just look at the Twitter figures, the, 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 guys, the guys who are getting two, three, four million followers are fundamentalist preachers and fundamentalist thinkers. And that's the reality. And do they go to jail? No, they, no, no, because they're, 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 they're Wahhabis. I yes. mean, this, this is, I think this is red blooded Wahhabism. I think the point Safa's making is that they don't go to jail. Yeah, 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 the yeah, people no, she's cool. talking but about. But also, how no, many hate following they, do you have? Yeah. 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 As okay. well. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I also have a question for Ms. Al Ahmed. Um, I want to ask about um, the popular movements in Saudi Arabia. And I mean, to what extent is there an opportunity to voice dissent beyond the Twitter sphere, blogosphere? And I mean, if it's all. Uh, is there any, do the, does the regime tolerate anything to a certain dis, uh, extent or is it cut off straight away and if so where do the, for example it was mentioned before that maybe the business elites will have an interest in the future to break with the regime, would they, um, I mean presumably they have educated kids and maybe kids with different opinions than their parents and so on, I mean is that something that is active, I mean especially at universities maybe? I mean popular dissent, one I think there's very little j proper journalism in Saudi Arabia that actually documents popular dissents in Saudi Arabia. But uh, if we're talking about different areas, for example in Breda, where the woman came out and demonstrated and uh, demanding the release of their husbands from jail, for example, those were bust and put in prison. And so uh, uh, dissents in, uh, in social media is much more tolerated than it is actually on the ground. One that, once that happens, regardless of the, uh, of, uh, of the kind of dissent, um, I think is not tolerated at all. And the price is really high when you dissent in reality and not in Twitter and, and, and Facebook. And, so, and that is a really an unfortunate thing because then if that, that kind of debate needs to happen for it to, to, to not come into the extreme. And so my answer to you is very, very little dissent is, uh, is happening on the ground. Well, I, I disagree with you again. I'm afraid Mohammed Katani, my friend, I would go to his majlis every Monday night. There'd be the most outrageous criticism of, of, of the regime and everything. Uh, all his radicals would gather around. I went with him to court and we, well, I didn't work. I just sat there and watched him while he got his, uh, his fellow um, uh, activists free from, from the Saudi uh, legal system um, and so on. And he was, he was, he was even tweeting that, that there should be a, um, a human rights uh, investigation into the interior minister. Yes. And this was all fine until he got involved in demonstrations on the ground and, and, and going with, with people to gather demonstrations outside prison. That is the no-no line for the Saudis. But do you think um, that's an appropriate line? Well, I'm not saying whether it's appropriate or not. I'm saying that's how it is. You can have much more debate and discussion and freedom of thought than I think Safa is representing, as long as you do not do the thing you're talking about, demonstrate on the streets. And that is a no-no So that basically, the you the can Saudi talk, government you can talk quietly at home in your own private houses, as long as you don't get out of your houses. That's true. And that, so yeah, true. so you have freedom of speech within your own I mean, that's what distinguishes yeah. Saudi Arabia from lots of other countries. There is a tolerance. I mean, it's one of those countries where nobody's frightened to talk about politics. Lots yeah. of people talk. I mean, I've been in places where Libya and Syria where people wouldn't say anything because they weren't sure that the, their, their family... There's no secret police in Saudi Arabia who comes and picks you up for expressing an opinion. The limit is don't try and organise. Don't try and get a bunch of other people who share your opinion together to try and change anything. That, and Robert's that's quite right, that, that's, that's, the, that's the limit. Yeah. And, and the question is, in the longer term, whether 
that outlet through social media, being able to express your opinion freely, but without organizing to do anything about it, is, is, is acceptable in the long term. And I think we've identified some of the things that mitigate against it because that fear of the, the Arab Spring, the fear of what happened in places like Libya, the people are question, you know, and to what extent does, um, uh, does the, this freedom satisfy people and at what extent does their economic opportunities begin to be constrained? You know, these are questions we don't have the answer to and, and what sort of time scale it would happen over. I think we'd all have a slightly different time scale. Uh, I mean, I would certainly you know, say it's not likely to lead to a revolution in the next 20 years. I, don't know, you know, I may be complacent, but uh, all these things are there and they're all churning. Uh, and I think that is one of the, you know, the, the dilemmas of Saudi Arabia. It's a very opaque society uh, and all this is happening but none of it seems to reach a point and which I, sorry, threatens like the system. I just to jump in with one thing. So much of our thought and discussion is based on the Marxist model with which we are familiar in Europe, that when the working classes get upset, they will rise against the government. Let us not forget the working class in Saudi Arabia are not Saudis. There are eight or nine million guest workers. Those are the oppressed slaves in Saudi Arabia, and their deal is, 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 is frankly pretty shocking. Uh, but that's your proletariat in Saudi Arabia. And so long as the level above that, the Saudis get their subsidies and so on, the, the Marxist model simply is not going to happen there. Okay, uh, the questions are mounting up now, as often happens, so let's, uh, <laughs> let's uh, crack through a few. Yeah. Uh, two short questions for William Patey. Um, the Saudis rushed to prop up Sisi in Egypt. What is it that they are so afraid of from the Muslim Brotherhood? And the second question is that the Saudi relationship with Pakistan is a very close one. King Salman um, made a visit last year and th the visits and the, the contact has continued with Pakistan where the Saudis have offered in excess of a billion dollars. The press have been wildly reporting that what is this for? It was, it was uh, noted in the press that it was a gift, but in fact, um, the, the talk is that this was for military and nuclear cover for the Saudis. Are you concerned that this may inflame further tensions in the Middle East? Well, I mean, on the, uh, on the issue of the, uh, the, the Pakistanis, um, I've for long um, uh, thought that uh, the Saudis, for all sorts of reasons, have developed a good relationship with the Pakistani government. I think they bought a nuclear weapon off the shelf. Uh, are we on the record here? Okay. <laughs> um, I think the Saudis have uh, as insurance against Iran getting a nuclear weapon. I think that would be their route. That would be their quick route to a, a nuclear weapon to counter this. So, so for, you know, there are all sorts of complex uh, reasons. Um, forgive my senility, but I've forgotten the first bit of your question. Muslim Brotherhood. But Muslim bro so the Pakistanis deny... Of course, well, of course they would, of course they would. But they, you know, it just so happens that the Chinese missiles that the Saudis bought from the Chinese happened to be adaptable to fit whatever the Pakistanis had off the shelf. So, I mean, this, nobody's ever going to admit any of this, you know, because Israel doesn't have a nuclear weapon either, does it? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, nobody's going to admit to that, and you can only speculate. And, and I should assure you that this is speculation on my part. I don't have any, uh, I haven't got some secret intelligence, unlike the weapons of mass destruction we had in Iraq, <laughs> which, which I knew existed. Um, uh, um, but the, um, so you've got, um, so you've got that. Uh, but the Muslim Brotherhood, I mean, I think the Muslim Brotherhood is, the, the Saudis have long hated the Muslim Brotherhood. I think they see them, and uh, not as sometimes in the West, uh, we see them as a sort of the Islamic democratic alternative to dictatorship. The Muslim, uh, I don't actually believe that. I think the Muslim Brotherhood are a different strand of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Uh, they have the same ultimate goals, they just have a different methodology. I don't think they're a terrorist organization, they're capable of violence, but their ultimate aim is to have an Islamic dictatorship. Um, and the Saudis, so that's not why the Saudis object to them. Uh, the Saudis object to them because they, they're part of a strain of political Islam which in Saudi Arabia would threaten the Al Saud. Uh, so uh, the, the, ISIL, the ISIL threat, the Muslim Brotherhood threat, the Al Qaeda threat, they all play into probably the most potent opposition force in Saudi Arabia. I don't think the opposition to the Al Saud is going to come from the liberal elite or uh, Safa and uh, you know, the people, the, the, you know, the, the, the Twitterati. It's going to come from the, the hardcore, uh, uh, the hardcore Islamists who think the Al Saud are a bit too liberal. 
Um, more organized. Yeah, and they're much better organized, and they have the mosque and this religious establishment. And, and, and Robert's absolutely right. The, the alternative to Al Saud isn't the liberal uh, businessmen, it's the <coughs> even more obscurantist uh, political Islamists. Mm -hmm. So that's but what they you fear. You forget I think. that a lot of the big business families are Islamists. Well, it depends what you mean by Islamists. Mm -hmm. No, who would indeed uh, accuse actually the royal family of not being Islamic enough? I mean, they're, mm. they're sort of hostages of each other. This this Wahhabi Al Saud alliance, you know, that's well, what some they, are, but it no. was the raison d'être mm. how they founded it. So the Al Saud are sort of beholden to, you know, they didn't change mm. the title of the king for nothing in 1982 to custodian of the mm. two holy mosques instead of His Majesty. Uh, they're, they're sort of a hostage of that, and and this parallel royal family almost of the al Sheikhs who direct okay. this, this religious establishment, that, that is definitely a threat. But there is a lot of money there as well. These are not poor people. Thank you very much. We've got three, three lined up, so just so everyone knows where they are. There's one, one in the corner there and one at the back. So you, yeah. Um, if the United States um, becomes self-sufficient in oil and energy, I mean, what, to what extent do you think the United States foreign policy towards Saudi would change, given that if they no longer need this cheap, plentiful supply of oil, because it seems to me the recent history of uh, American relations with Saudi is that the Americans have propped up the Saudi regime, and that the 1991 Gulf War was not about uh, rescuing Kuwait, it was, it was basically keeping the Saudis in power, and in return, um, the Saudis have financed American foreign policy, they basically paid for the Gulf War, and uh, in return, uh, the West have, have sold them weapons, and the West have, have kept the Saudis in power be basically because of oil. And so I was wondering what you think if the United States does become um, self-sufficient energy, they no longer need to prop up this corrupt medieval regime, and they <laughs> could actually uh, be more objective in terms of their foreign policy towards Saudi. Well, can I leave okay, William I think everyone, everyone wants to speak on this, so I'll ask you to be uh, quickly. Rapid. Yeah. The Saudis I speak to are delighted at fracking. They are delighted at America becoming self-sufficient in oil. Why? For the reason that William mentioned earlier. With America going back onto oil, it means that the market for oil will continue. And they couldn't, they couldn't give a damn if America never buys another barrel of Saudi oil. And, and I'm sure one of these experts will obviously explain to us that there's no such thing as a barrel of Saudi oil. It all goes into one big pool. And uh, the concept of... Anyway, that, that, that's a different issue. But the, the, the main point is that fracking was welcomed by the Saudis because they were getting worried about the development in America of alternative technologies, which, as William says, they're working on themselves. Um, now America's getting hooked again on the old-fashioned petrol engine, and that suits the Saudis just very well. As, as Sheikh Kimani used to say, the Stone Age did not end because the world ran out of stone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I'm not sure the Saudis are quite as sanguine as as, as Robert um, suggests. I think there is a there is a sense within Saudi Arabia uh, questioning the American commitment to their defence and security. It's been a fundamental pillar of Saudi foreign policy over decades, and they are beginning to question it. Um, indeed, to the extent that they think that a nuclear deal is a is a precursor to America switching back its uh, favoured alliance to Iran uh, in the days of the Shah. Now, there are all sorts of uh, reasons why that will never happen or, or can't happen. But this, a lot of the Saudis I talk to are very difficult to persuade otherwise about this. So they do fear that. I think it's a misplaced fear. I think Robert's quite right. Um, oil is a globally traded commodity and the price of oil, the price of energy, whether it's oil or any other form of energy, is something in which the United States is intensely interested in. So they will have strategic interests in the Middle East regardless. But I think the Saudis are, um, are adding up two and two and coming to five. And the two and two is energy independence of the United States and a, 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 an absence of an Obama doctrine are basically a United States that's lost its mojo in the Middle East. It doesn't know what to do. It hasn't got a strategic vision. It's, uh, it's suffering a kind of almost post-Vietnam type, post-Iraq, uh, post-Afghanistan, the hesitancy over Syria, the sort of uh, let, letting the Europeans do a little bit in Libya, but not quite enough to do the full hog. So that is creating a vacuum in the Middle East, and the Saudis are ascribing all sorts of reasons 
for it. And what you're seeing is a much more active Saudi foreign policy as a result. If the Americans are not going to defend them against the Iranians, they're going to do it themselves. And what you're seeing is a, you're, you're seeing a kind of, uh, a, 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 like a Cold War. You've got Saudi Iranian rivalry across the whole of the, uh, the uh, whole of the hot spots in the Middle East. And I think the Houthi, the Houthi thing is an exaggeration. I don't think the Houthis got anything to do with Iran. Mm -hmm. It's now become a part of the Saudi Iranian. Uh, rivalry, part of the Sunni-Shia split. Uh, the, the, the Saudis don't like the influence that the Iranians have in Lebanon through Hezbollah, in Palestine through Hamas, in Iraq through the uh, Shia government, in, uh, in Bahrain through the Shia protests, and now they've wrapped up the Houthis in this, I think mistakenly. Um, so there is a big, there is a, a degree of angst in Saudi Arabia, which partly stems from, I think, their their uh, misplaced uh, uh, worry about U.S. energy independence. William, I agree with I you. I think that the Saudis are indeed <laughs> going to hedge their bets that if America thinks the Saudi I, bank I, has I, become small you, enough to fail, uh, you get a change that they're going to look after their interests more proactively. But the thing is, of course, that uh, indeed interest in oil will not run out. If the Americans don't buy it, they'll sell it to India and China. What's interesting for the 21st century is that changing world order, because I don't think China or India will step up the plate in a sort of, you know, becoming the self-proclaimed uh, organizer of world order. Uh, America did in the last 50, and, and probably that is the scariest thought for Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask, um, say something were to happen in Saudi Arabia, big or small, what do you think, considering it's considered the like linchpin of the Gulf region, what do you think the effect on the Gulf states would be? And is it still the linchpin of the region with the rise of Bahrain and Qatar? Uh, I think it depends what happens. I mean, I think it, your question is very wide. <laughs> it's a, I mean, it, it is Saudi Arabia is the linchpin of the Gulf for sure. And so any major changes in Saudi Arabia would affect the Gulf, but it totally depends on what it is. I mean, if there was a Libya-style breakdown, the Gulf would be finished. But there isn't going to be, is there? Would it? No, I'm just saying if there would. Yeah, I think if, yeah, the, the 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 rest of the Gulf can't really survive no. uh, a major turmoil in Saudi Arabia. Okay, at the back. Yeah. <clears throat> so I have a question for you. We're talking quite extensively about our views of Saudi Arabia. I'd really like to know what um, the average person in Saudi Arabia thinks of the West and of China. What's the common narrative that we're getting fed back on that wonderful Twitterati on ourselves? What do the, what do the, what do the Saudis think of the West? Yeah. Better ask the Saudi. Oh. <laughs> I think that, uh, there's no uh, one single view. I mean, uh, I, I think part of the reason, part of the problem of how people see Saudi Arabia is they think this one big hegemonic block of everybody sees the world the same way. Saudi Arabia is a really complex country with very diverse opinions within it. And so there's no one opinion about the West. I mean, some people think of it as a threat and they want to do everything to preserve Saudi Arabia from it. And some can't wait for it. So, I mean, it's too diverse to answer that question in, in any way. That is just... I, I quite agree with, with, with Safa, but I just add one thing. That, uh, <laughs> they, um, no, that um, a lot of my friends have nothing but contempt for the West and great anger at the way in which we look down on them. And they say, how do you dare lecture us when you raise your teenage girls to lift their skirts up, get drunk on a Saturday night, get laid before they get married. That is shocking to a lot of my Saudi friends. They laugh at the things we call old age people's homes. They say, how can you possibly, what moral society lets the old people leave the family and go into these institutions you call care homes which don't take care of them? And what strikes me from my years of living in Saudi Arabia is that they feel as much scorn and misunderstand us as much as we despise wrongly, in my opinion, and misunderstand them. Uh, well, when I was as a diplomat in Saudi, um, lots of Saudis um, would come and they have a mistaken view of the power of the West. 
um, you were always torn between, you know, and it's not just Saudis, frankly. I think quite a lot of people in the Middle East have this view that somehow we are shaping the whole Middle East and anything that happens in the Middle East is down to uh, uh, machinations in Washington and to a lesser degree London. Um, and uh, I have a sort of mantra now in the Middle East, if there's a prospect of a conspiracy or a cock-up, 99% of the time it's going to be a cock-up because conspiracies are really difficult to manage. <laughs> uh, and we're really not very good at them. So, you know, uh, but there's no good arguing with... There's no good arguing with a Saudi or anybody else in the Middle East that it's not really a conspiracy. It's just a mess. Or with a journalist. Or a journalist, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Uh, uh, my question actually is, uh, we touched on, a, uh, touched on it a little bit earlier on, it's about Iran. Um, I mean, you were sort of painting the Shia Crescent uh, just a few minutes ago. But uh, I'm just curious about the rise of Iran uh, in, in the region and the Iranian power. Um, uh, I mean, the, the issue, uh, we're here to talk about the sort of peril that the Saudi, the Saudi might be in. I'm just wondering what the panel has to say about that, the rise of Iranian power in relation to Saudi. Yeah, so let's ask you, do, 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 do the Saudis have an exaggerated fear of what's going on? I don't have an exaggerated fear. They know that the only country capable of competing with them in the Gulf is Iran. And that was already the situation when the Shah was there. They were both, you know, posturing towards Washington, who was the best policeman of the Persian Gulf. And when there was a different regime in Iran, that was God sent for the Saudis, you know. Wahhabism has this strong anti-Sufi, anti-Shia dimension to it anyway. And now you have a regime that plays the Shia card. So for the Saudis, it Sectarianism is totally instrumentalized in politics in the Middle East. It's not the reason for these conflicts. It's, and that is why now the terminology has changed already. When the Yemen thing came up, a Nobel Prize winner from Yemen had the audacity of talking, the Persians are coming. Mm -hmm. It becomes very primordial of the old Arab-Persian opposition more than Shias versus Sunnis. She has Muslim and, and, Brotherhood, so. Yeah. And it's really jingoism. It's the, you know, it's a, a way of popular Sorry. populism that is, that's very dangerous. I couldn't agree with you more about utilizing sectarianism as language of conflict, especially in Yemen, because now, like, the Houthis all of a sudden are like the Shia Iranian backed militia. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I mean, first there's AD, so they're just convoluting a lot of terminology and overstating the power of the Iranians over the Houthis. I mean, uh, uh, let's talk about external power. Saudi Arabia has been paying billions into Yemen for decades right now. So they, they've been in this game in Yemen much, much uh, earlier than the Iranians have. And I, I, I think, but it, it's, it's quite convenient to say everything's a pro proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran mm. when things are much more complicated than that. Yet, it's become really easy to say it that way. So then uh, when we write articles about Yemen, everything falls into that proxy war. And you think you understand it, but Yemen is so much more complex than that. I mean, yes, they have support from Iran, but not to the extent that everybody is talking about. Like, you can't just blatantly say Iran backed Shia militia. Like, that. it's just so overstating the issue. Yeah. Yet, everybody on the ground is using it. Yeah? And in the 60s, I mean, the Saudis backed the Zaidi Imam it. Yes, you know, I exactly. mean, they were, they were the supporters against yeah. the Republicans. So yeah. it really is. I mean, it's a bit like Northern Ireland. You know, it, you know, it may have seemed between Protestants and Catholics, but it wasn't. It was economic and political can, power. Can I just ask, Sabbat, don't you think Saudi has really met its Vietnam in, in, in Yemen? I mean, Not yet. Not yet. Not no. yet. They should no. keep troops But I mean, you there. say they've been <laughs> pouring money in, which is absolutely right, for years. Yeah. Their man, man is kicked out. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me... I mean, it will be the Vietnam if they put troops in. If they put troops in, they're not... Uh, that, that will be the problematic thing. I, I, I think they've been trying to, to know... I mean, this is why they're asking the, the, the Pakistanis to get involved and the, and the Egyptians and stuff. They know if they get into Yemen. I mean... It, 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 it will be a disaster for the Saudis, and I think it will be a disaster in an epic way, humanitarian. I, I don't think the Saudis can handle that. I mean, when was the last time they actually were in a ground war? Yemen in mm -hmm. the 60s. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I do hope that they remember that, and I think this is part of the reason why they're not in a hurry to get back into Yemen. Right, I'm going to take th three more questions before we wrap up. And the first one is there, and then there, and then there. So, yeah. Thank you. I wanted to direct my question at Robert. In, um, in your book, you make clear the relationship between the, um, the Al Saud family and the Wahhabi Aluma within, within Saudi and how that kind of power balancing mm -hmm. plays out. Um, I was wondering if you could, if you could speculate on what um, you think the, um, the Aluma's view of ISIS is and theologically and just generally what their view of 
I, 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 I wouldn't consider my, well, I, I, I'd, I'd like Safa to talk about that. I, I don't think, you're talking about the, the Wahhabi establishment. Yes, yeah. The, the and what they see. What do they think of ISIS? I haven't been to Saudi for a year. I, I, this is a new thing to me. ISIS is not new. No, no. Well, what do you well, think they would me. think about? I, I haven't talked to any Saudis. I, cou I couldn't answer the question. Really? What do the ulama think about ISIS? Yeah. I don't know what the ulama think about <laughs> ISIS. I, I can guess what they might think, but I wouldn't want to get... have you got a view? Have you got a view? I think uh, the, the basic premise of what ISIS believe is not very alien to what we have in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I, but I think... Uh, what is happening in Saudi Arabia right now is, is really quite problematic about the language that ISIS uses and how we are taught in schools. And so there is this whole trying to disassociate from uh, the ideology of ISIS. And uh, yet we are taught a lot of the basic things in Saudi Arabia. And so that is a really problematic issue for a lot of people, right? And so it's, uh, it's one of the things, I mean, uh, one of the princes came out and says, we are not pushing Wahhabi ideology, which is, I think, news to a lot of people. Um, and so I think there is real debate inside Saudi Arabia now. And forget the, the religious establishment, but for the people themselves, I mean, for, for, for the past year, everybody is asking, Asking, why are all our youth going uh, joining ISIS? What mm. is what are the things that are not provided inside Saudi Arabia that are making these youths join ISIS? And and so this is an existential problem in Saudi Arabia right now. The religious institution, how we are taught as Muslims in Saudi Arabia, and how that relates to these groups. And I, I think it's a really important issue that that we are dealing with inside Saudi Arabia. I mean, in Syria, and you have this paradox of civil war. You have Saudi planes overhead shooting at ISIS, and many of the ISIS fighters are young Saudis. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's the schizophrenia yeah, yeah, yeah. place. Joining yeah. ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra. Like, yeah. you know, there was a joke yeah. on Twitter about, it's like, okay, so these two Saudis, one joins ISIS and one joins Jabhat al-Nusra. It's like, how about you just go in the backyard and you fight it out rather than go into Syria? So. Yeah. Uh, that is exactly where you answer is what the ulama think about it. They don't like that one little bit because these young guys escape their control and decide to join organizations like ISIS and, and, and similar movements in Syria and Iraq because they, they see their own ulama as sellouts and in cahoots with the regime. And regardless of what ISIS is doing, there is a sort of a misplaced glamour attached to it. But even within that segment, Al-Qaeda doesn't like ISIS. There's fatwa after fatwa that the caliph is illegal. You say that Obama's lost his mojo in the Middle East. Um, Henry Kissinger, during the Iran-Iraq war, was asked why America was funding arms to both sides. He said that anything that in increased the natural an animosity between Sunni and Shia kept the Middle East weak, which is in the interests of the West. Is this not still happening? Well, it would be if we were actually directing it, um, <laughs> uh, and we had any say in it. Uh, you know, I think uh, I'm a great fan of Kissinger. Actually, he's a very, <laughs> he's a real real politician. You know, and he's very honest in his uh, in his um, immorality. Um, but uh, so uh, you know, he, he's a guy you can respect. Uh, I'm not sure that's true. It would be. It might be true if we were controlling this, uh, but we're not. Uh, I mean, the idea that. Uh, the Bush went into Iraq to kind of perpetuate a, 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 a Sunni Shia divide. He, he had no bloody idea why he was going into Iraq, uh, <laughs> uh, other than uh, other but than get I rid say of Saddam. There's something even worse than that. Mm. I think, regardless of the West, we in the Middle East need to take responsibility for the conflicts that mm. we are perpetuating. So regardless, I mean, we, ha we had these conversations about the civil war in Lebanon. It's like, you know, even if, uh, if Israel and all the other different parties are giving you guns and money, it doesn't mean that you have to pick up Go that gun it. and fight someone else that mm. used to be your neighbor. And so I think we have to be honest with ourselves, with all these conspiracy theories in the Middle East. We need to take ownership of the conflicts that we decide to perpetuate. So our media, is using the language of sectarianism. Our media is saying Shia versus Sunni. So our media needs to take responsibility. Our societies need to take responsibility as well. If you choose to kill someone else because they're of a different faith, then that's your problem. It's not Bush's problem or Obama's or anybody else's. Last question. Thank you. Uh, I guess one of, uh, linked to the last two questions on kind of contradictions within Saudi Arabia's foreign policy. So for example, Saudi funding to the UN Counterterrorism Center to the tune of $100 million towards the end of last year, 
and then compared to Saudi support in kind of coalescing Jabhat al-Nusra at present. How does the West, UK and USA engage with these contradictions? In the sense, on the one hand, at the moment, you've got kind of edging towards an Iranian nuclear deal. And on the other hand, you've got the UK, for example, uh, providing over 44% of Saudi's arms, which are being used in Yemen. Obviously, Saudi's got a lot more, we give too much agency to the West in these situations. But even then, there is agency on the part of the West. How does the West engage with Saudi Arabia? Could you find some common principled themes through Western foreign policy? Yeah, I mean, I think, funnily enough, I think Saudi Arabia is, is a genuine counter-terrorist ally of the West. I mean, we wouldn't do it if we didn't. I mean, I think there's, the, the certain, I don't think there's any contradiction between uh, Saudi f uh, funding the UN counter-terrorist center. I mean, I know Saudi Arabia gets accused of funding uh, terrorists, funding ISIS and all of that. Uh, I'm pretty confident the Saudi government doesn't do it. Uh, I'd be less confident that there wouldn't be individual Saudis who might uh, have means of funding it. I'm pretty confident that uh, uh, Mohammed bin Nayef, who's in charge of this, uh, works pretty hard to try and find out how it how it's going on. So there are, there, uh, so I think I think we sh I I would take at face value Saudi Arabia's objection uh, as a counter-terrorist ally. It doesn't mean to say there isn't a whole bunch of contradictions. Uh, Safa's mentioned the contradiction that the base plate of Wahhabism uh, it, it feeds some of the ideology, the, the sort of teachings that go on in school. You know, uh, ISIS and Al Qaeda can build on that and then have a diversion. Um, and things like Jabhat al Nusra, it's a bit like w where we, when we were involved in Afghanistan. We kind of funded the Mujahideen because they were opposed to the Russians, and then the Mujahideen got out of control and they turned on us. You, know, you could have predicted that. But we, you know, and, and likely Jabhat al Nusra was, was one of those early organizations that was anti Assad, that was a part of the wider anti Assad coalition, and was at the time. I may still be at the respectable end of, of, of the Islamic opposition. Now, whether they're still there, at the, I don't think Britain would have ever regarded them at the respectable end, but there was a certain amount of tolerance. But can I say also that very little good journalism has been done mm. and digging into how much Saudi Arabia actually pays for these things, mm. actually connecting the dots of the finances. Mm. I think it's so easy to say that Saudi Arabia is funding X, Y, and Z, uh, and also Iran funding X, Y, and Z. Uh, but actually digging into the connection with that. Like, I would love to see a proper article about how much money uh, the Houthis are getting from Iran or how much money the different Syrian factions are actually. I'm not saying that that's not happening. I'm saying actually digging into the extent of that support. I think that's really important. Yeah, everybody takes it for granted that that extensive relationship is there with very little substance. Well, lots of accusations are made about Saudi Arabia. Well, let me tell you that the, the, you know, the, the Western intelligence services are working hard on this because they want to find out where they're getting their money. Uh, and indeed, the obligation, I'm a director of a bank, <laughs> you're a banker and a diplomat, <laughs> my God. Uh, you know, uh, director of a bank, and, you know, and we are under a huge obligation to try and, so it's not going through the banking system. I can be pretty certain of that. Certainly not my bank, anyway. Um, not it's not going through the bank. You're not system. HSBC, are you? I am HSBC. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely happy to be a hate figure. Uh, but you know, so th there is there is a, so there is quite a lot of work going into it. So I think um, it, you know we have a, such a strong interest in stopping it happening. Uh, and there's all sorts of uh, mechanisms to uh, delve into this. Uh, but there are other mechanisms. You know, there's the Hawali system. There's the informal system. There's, there are bags of cash. Uh, uh, that's how, but that's not how ISIS is getting its money. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. Very, very interesting evening. And thank you very much to a very good <laughs> I'm glad we didn't go into the banking crisis.